This tutorial is to introduce the linear momentum equation, but today we will only work on two examples to get you started. We will work through three harder examples in the next tutorial. I know that the material of this course is getting harder and harder now. Professor Lee once mentioned that the material before and after the midterm is hard. So here is the midterm, and we are here at chapter 5. And chapter 6 is waiting for you after the midterm. But just endure these two chapters, and you will feel things getting much more easier later. So here is the Reynolds transport theorem. The derivation is a bit too long, so I don't want to derive it here. Just go to Professor Lee's lecture if you want to hear the derivation. But actually, you have learned these two guys in thermodynamics. For example, the total volume and total enthalpy are extensive parameters. The specific volume and specific enthalpy are the corresponding intensive parameters, and they do not depend on mass. For moving control volume, we have to take the relative velocity for this term. Actually, the Reynolds transport theorem is just a mathematical reformulation of the material derivative, so that we can use it to do control volume analysis. Indeed, the whole chapter 5 here is just an application of Reynolds transport theorem. In this chapter, we take the intensive parameter B as 1, velocity, and specific energy. Then after some simplification, we get the three important equations in this chapter. So let's finish the mass conservation here. The subscript system here is indeed the particle in the control volume in certain time. We are not doing nuclear reactions here, so there can't be change in mass. So this term goes away, and we are left with a fancy way of writing mass conservation. But in this tutorial, we focus on the middle equation here. If we simplify the previous side with the Newton's second law, we will eventually get this relation. If the flow is steady, then any partial partial t goes to zero. So this term goes away, and we are left with this equation. But in fact, we can further decompose this result into x, y, z component. If u is the x component of velocity, then we have this equation. Actually, this component form of linear momentum equation is much more practical, since we usually do force balance component by component. For moving control volume at constant velocity, we shall use the relative velocity instead. I will give an example in the next video. To use the linear momentum equation, we have to consider all the forces on a control volume. If we take the control volume to include the fluid only, then we only have to consider these three kind of forces. Note that the parallel component for the surface force is due to a friction. So let's look at our first example. And let's follow the instruction in the previous slide, and take this as the control volume. Let's draw a free body diagram of that. We have pressure from the top, the weight of the fluid itself, and the surface force between the nozzle and the fluid. But the question asks for the anchoring force, and the anchoring force shall support the weight of the nozzle in addition to the fluid. So let's draw the nozzle out. This is the weight of the nozzle and the anchoring force, and R shall point down here. Since this R here is the force exerted by the nozzle on the water, and this R is the force exerted by the water on the nozzle, by Newton's third law, these two forces go against each other and have the same magnitude. And let's just label this as body 1 and this as body 2. And let's just write down the linear momentum equation in the Z component. Under steady condition, the force in Z direction is just this integral. And for this body, only this force is pointing up, and the other two is pointing down. So the force in Z component is... And let's make R as the subject. Considering the nozzle, only the anchoring force is pointing up, and the other two forces are pointing down. And we expand this term out. But what is this term? Let's redraw our water control volume. We have two flat surfaces, and one curved surface, and their normal vectors goes this way.
So now we can expand this integral. But for surface 3, this dot product must go 0, otherwise there would be some fluid flowing from surface 3, which is impossible. And now we consider surface 1. The set component of velocity is negative W1. It is negative because the velocity goes against the set asset. Rho is just rho. And this dot product here, let's just write this out. And give a sketch of surface 1 and its normal vector and our velocity is going this way these two vectors are parallel this goes negative 1 and that is w here and this goes 1 so we get negative w1 and we can pull out all the constant and this integral is just the area of 1 We can combine these three terms to get the mass flow rate, and we get If we repeat this for surface 2 This W becomes negative W2, rho is rho, and we draw another figure for this dot product So, this time is plus W2 and we get so this thing is equal to and we can now write our FAS but this term is annoying what is the rate of the fluid? we know that rate equals gamma v so we have to calculate the volume of the first term this similar triangle comes from here and from this similar triangle we can write down And we calculate the volume of the back cone. For the small cone, So, the volume of water is and we get rate of the water is so Now what remains is to get the values of each term and plug in this equation so let's do this term first. We have Q equals A1W1 and A2W2. So we calculate A1 first. And W1 equals And we have W2 equals And we revise our formula And we substitute the values
and we are done with this example. So, the important message I want to give in the previous example is that you may find that this integral is very annoying. But let's just consider system with one outlet and one inlet only. So we have this integral equals where 1 is the inlet and 2 is the outlet. And this integral for any other surface will give 0. It is because for other surfaces, there cannot be any normal component to the surface. And we can further pull the constant out and become And this row A3 here are just the mass flow rates, with the sign determined by whether the fluid is coming out of the control volume or into the control volume. We already see why the formula is true in the previous example. So the whole thing becomes like this after simplification. Our next example here is an easy conceptual question. For any geometry here, we can take the whole thing as the control volume and set this as the x direction so that we can write down the x component of linear momentum equation let's suppose our device would move right after release then before release there must be a force in this direction to hold the device so our submission fx here is negative rx and that is negative for the four devices here there is only one inlet and one outlet so let's adopt the convention that 1 is the inlet and 2 is the outlet. So our integral is just, now let's start from the inlet term. The mass flow rate term is negative and for the outlet is positive. But we have m1 equals m2 equals m. So we can factor the m out. But we require that this whole thing here is more than zero. And this term here is always positive. So we require that this term is negative. That is u2 smaller than u1. Now we can start looking at each of the choice. For case A, the inlet velocity is greater than 0. And the outlet is smaller than 0. So we have u1 greater than 0 greater than u2. Which is exactly what we assume. So it will move right. For case B, both u1 and u2 are greater than 0. But by continuity equation, A1 U1 equals A2 U2, since the flow is incompressible. So we have U1 equals, and from the figure, A2 is greater than A1. So this fraction is greater than 1. So that, and that is again what we assume. So it is going right again. For case C, we have U2 equals 0, since there is no x component in the outlet velocity. And we have u1 greater than 0. So u1 greater than u2. And it is going right again. For case D, we have u1 and u2 greater than 0. But u1 equals u2 a2 divided by a1. And this fraction is now smaller than 1. So that u1 is smaller than u2. And finally, we have a case that contradicts our assumption. So this will go left. So I leave this problem for your exercise, but this is annoying in the sense that the flowing fluid is air. The change in pressure here is really great. So the flow is in fact compressible. So you have to use mass balance and ideal gas law to find the velocity at section 1, as you did in thermodynamics. Then you can do force balance along the flow direction, but don't miss out the pressure on the both sides. So today we talk about Reynolds transport theorem. And more importantly, what is linear momentum equation and how to use it? We also went through two examples about how we can use linear momentum equation. Hope you enjoyed this tutorial and thanks for watching. Feel free to ask us any question and give us any feedback in the comments.